So, all right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, this webinar is presented to you um, and, and it's on the promising syllabus. It is based on um, the book, Ken Bain's What the Best College Teachers Do. I've heard of that. And yeah, I bet you have. And, and I tell you what, one would think that because we're also doing kind of a presentation on the book on Friday, that these two were planned because they came from the same resource. But I'm really not that good. So <laughs> <laughs> it just so happened that this is our theme for the week is what oh. the best college teachers do. That, that's what we're going to say. So educators increasingly agree that a learner-centered syllabus is associated with better rapport between the students and the teachers and increased student motivation, achievement, and empowerment. Accordingly, in 2009, the researchers Cullen and Harris, which you are going to hear about them a lot in the next hour, developed a rubric for assessing the degree to which a syllabus is learner-centered versus teacher-centered. And so in this webinar, our sole purpose is to discuss Cullen and Harris's rubric and consider ways in which you can make your syllabus more learner-centered. So the outline for this evening is, is I want to talk super quickly about teacher and centered and learner centered continuum. Um, we are going to talk about the purpose of a syllabus and why learner centered um, appearing to be more effective um, with regards to how we use our words in our syllabus. And then um, we're going to take that rubric and deconstruct it and um, discuss the key qualities of a learner-centered syllabus. So as you can see on the screen, I have a diagram here, kind of a teacher-learner-centered continuum, where the teacher-centered um, kind of framework or mindset. Um, the teacher is the formal authority, they are the experts, um, and, and the use of all the class time is determined by that teacher. So in a way, it is exactly how I would say a majority of us grew up as a student. Our, our rooms were teacher centered. But as more and more research has been done on teaching and learning and student success, um, they have found that by centering the instruction around the student, the teacher is the facilitator, you get better results. And, you, and what that means is students learn better. And so as we go through this webinar and talk about a, a learner-centered or student-centered syllabi, um, you can kind of in your mind figure out the, where you kind of fit on this continuum with regards to the language and the structure of your syllabus. Um, and you can also think about um, where you want to go to improve. You need to move a little bit more towards the centered, um, or is there some aspect of your class that really has to be teacher-centered in order for it to be successful? So just keep this um, graphic in mind as we go through the presentation. So the syllabus can take on many different forms and serve many different purposes. First and foremost, we view the syllabus as a contract. It defines and establishes the respective duties, roles, and responsibilities of the student and the teacher. Um, elements in this contract include a description of um, rules, uh, a description of rules regarding plagiarism, academic dishonesty, um, we have calendar with course events, policies on grading, exams, revising, um, all those, all of those um, elements that we, we have typically in our, in our syllabus. Another purpose for a syllabus is the syllabus is also considered a permanent record. 
that contains detailed and accurate information regarding about course requirements and content and the course catalog description and accurate summaries of student learning outcomes, evaluation procedures, course content, and our required readings, textbooks, and other materials. And um, at this time, I would like to ask if you would um, mute yourself for now. That way we can um, make kind of a clean recording here and, and that way we, we won't have that background of noise. So if you'll just take a minute and mute yourself, I would appreciate it. Okay. Now, on the next slide, we start talking about the purpose of the syllabus, but we're moving towards a more student-centered or learner-centered focus. Um, the syllabus here can serve as a cognitive map and an actual learning tool for the st students. So we've kind of switched focus here. That is, the syllabus allows teachers to provide students with a visual layout of the course and ideally an explanation of how to succeed. Such a student or such a syllabus is, is very student centered and it includes detailed success tips, um, maybe common misconceptions and pitfalls that students encounter in your particular content area or course and how to avoid them. It is also helpful to have an, and student centered focus to have a list of campus resources such as the writing center, the disability, um, any kind of student success initiatives, um, as well as embedded explanations of course assignments, assessments, and activities. So not just lists, but explanations. So why construct a learner-centered syllabus? As alluded to previously, there is mounting evidence that learner-centered syllabi can have positive effects on both the students and the teacher. First, the research suggests that when teachers construct learner-centered syllabi, students are empowered and behave better in class. A learner-centered syllabus may cause students to perceive the teacher as um, possessing more exemplary teaching characteristics, such as approachability and flexibility, and thus a greater rapport is established. Um, moreover, the research by uh -uh. Cullen hey, and... You've got to do this. You sit right here. By Cullen... Um, oh, my goodness. Hey, Roxanne, can you find your mute button for me, please? And tell, okay. that, cute, that, tell that cute little puppy we said hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. That's okay. fantastic. Okay. Um, no problem. So what, the other thing that research found was that students seem to remember more details from the learner-centered syllabus. And, and I personally feel like the reason for that is, is, is you are um, phrasing and forming your syllabi so that it... Um, shows them that you're thinking about them, not just the content of the class. So in the spirit of research, I will explain to you um, or describe to you a, a, a research design um, that, that was conducted on learner-centered syllabi. Um, students were asked to read a hypothetical course syllabi um, that were independently rated as learner-centered or teacher-centered using this rubric that we're going to be discussing here in a minute. Students then rated the instructor associated with each syllabi on kind of a student-professor rapport teaching behavior scale. And what they found was um, Students who read, now this is not even having the instructor interact with them. This is just a survey after reading only the syllabus. And what they found is students who read this learner-centered syllabus perceived the teacher as a possessing more rapport with the student in terms of engagement and perception and exhibiting higher levels of kind of a master teacher um, quality as approachable, personable, creative, interesting. Um, so 
just by changing the, the, the words and kind of the structure of your syllabus before class even started, the mindset of the student had been changed. Um, additionally, they did a recall test on those same students and, and the students who received the learner syllabi recalled, recalled, recalled more elements of the syllabus than the ones of the teacher centered. So that's kind of um, the, the, the background of where we are going um, with, the, with this webinar tonight. And now we're going to talk about how to construct a learner-centered syllabus by, by breaking down this rubric. So Cullen and Harris describe several key qualities of a learner-centered syllabus. These include the major factors that establish community, um, for example, accessibility of the teacher, the role of collaboration, and another factor is those that define the balance of power and control between the student and teacher. And then the third factor is those that include evaluation and assessment. Now, on the rubric, there are 15 elements, and each element is rated on a scale of 1 being teacher-centered to 4 being more learner-centered. And the, the 15 elements of the, this rubric is divided among your sub-factors here of community, power, and control, and evaluation and assessment. So let's take a quick look here at the components of the rubric. So I'm not going to sit here and read the screen, <laughs> but I am going to take you a second to, to, for you to kind of look at it and um, get the feel for what they're going after here in community. talk about um, office hours, um, rationales for assignments, and collaboration in this particular section of the rubric. And then in the next section covers the factor of power and control. Here you see um, kind of participation focus, um, outside resources, and um, then kind of how your learning outcomes is weighted. And then the third section is about, or the third factor is about evaluation and assessment. And here we kind of get down into how you grade. How are your grades tied to your outcomes? Um, do you have com complete information about course grading and assessment? allowing students to revise and redo. So to show you how this exam, um, how this would work if you were to use this rubric, and I'll, and I'll get this posted up on our site so that you, if you would like to kind of test your, evaluate your syllabi um, using this rubric, it will be available to you. But look here for an example. One of the community sub-factors, so community is a big piece, developing community within the, the framework of your syllabus. One of the sub-factors of community is teacher accessibility. And so you would rate yourself a one if you have prescribed office hours only listed on your syllabus. If you have office hours, phone, and email listed, then you would be a two. Three means you would, you know, we're increasing your accessibility, multiple means of access and encouraging interaction. And four means multiple means of access, but you require them to interact. And in one of the studies or, um, I, I was reading about the instructor actually required office at visits to office hours as a part of the student's um, grading scheme. I thought that was different. Um, so here we are going to look at, and, and, and in the, this next section, section, which will finish us up, um, I want you to, in your mind, think about your syllabus and, 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 and kind of assess what you have 
based on us deconstructing these three major components of a learner-centered syllabi. So what does it mean to have community in your syllabus? And as a function of your syllabus, community in your course. Now Cullen and Harris suggest that your syllabus should express your desire to create a community of learners in your classroom. They also observe that you can establish community through specific syllabus elements, namely accessibility of the teacher, the learning rationale, why we should be learning this, and required collaborations. So your syllabus is an opportunity to kind of communicate some of the things um, or reiterate some of the things that you may already be telling them in class. If you were to survey your students and ask them, how accessible do you think I am? What would their response be? Would it be very accessible? Not accessible at all? Somewhat accessible? In other words, you, how can your students contact you? On one side of the spectrum or continuum, the teacher-centered, if you only list your office hours and office phone number, students may find you unapproachable or inaccessible just by the words on that page. If you are interested in incorporating learner center elements into your syllabus, then you would need to do more. You should not only list your office hours and office phone number, but dare I say it, your cell or mobile phone number. Now, if that provides, if providing your cell number creates some privacy problems, um, and it's also not a good idea with regards to um, official communication within the Midway University community, you can always use the Ring Central's app on your cell phone. Um, I use that and that's how I communicate with all of my work study students. Um, this will allow you to text your students various course announcements and other communications through a Midway University supported technology. Alternatively, or in addition, you should encourage, highly encourage your students to visit with you at your office or even require them to stop by during your office hours. Now, another part of establishing community is learner rationale. Do you provide a detailed rationale for each type of assignment and assessment tied to the learning outcome? If you only list the details of the assignment or the assessment, like what to do and when, but not provide a reason for your requirements, then your syllabus may tend to be more teacher-centered. For example, why do you give exams? Perhaps your syllabus could describe what your exams are like, types of questions, comprehensive or not, um, but it's really important um, and, and, and almost out of respect for the student to explain why you believe these assignments and assessments are important for student learning. It makes me think of when my children were younger and you'd say, do this. And the first thing they ask is, why? So by answering that why in our syllabi, um, we kind of provide them reason for doing it, not just a list of things to do. So again, I want to take a minute here and, and kind of let you look at the screen. Um, on the left side of the, the screen, you'll see a teacher-centered learner rationale. On the right side, you take um, an example of a learner-centered. So the teacher-centered basically just tells the students what is expected of them. The learner-centered explains why this is important. Becoming a critical reader will help you in your future career. 
So just explaining it one sentence further does wonders for changing your syllabus from learner center, teacher center to learner centered. So in developing community within your syllabi, incorporating collaborative learning is important. Incorporating collaborative learning into your class can increase student learning. That's a known fact. It increases student engagement, class attendance, and conceptual understanding of the content. When creating a learner-centered syllabus, it's very important to not only encourage, but require collaboration in your course. Now, not all courses are amenable to substantial amounts of collaboration. I, I, I understand that. But most can incorporate it to some degree in ways that are often overlooked. So according to Cullen and Harris's rubric, if you prohibit co collaboration and your syllabus reflects this, then your syllabus is considered teacher-centered regarding this element. However, if you highly encourage or require collaboration and use collaborative techniques in your class as described in the syllabus, this element of your syllabus is considered highly learner-centered. So you can foster collaboration through course assignments, um, requiring it during and or out of class time. So here is an example of a learner-centered syllabus um, discussing collaboration. All right, moving right along here. So developing community within your syllabus is one factor um, that Cullen and Harris thinks you can focus on to um, make your syllabus more learner-centered. Another one is power and control. Relinquishing control may arguably be the most difficult change you would make in your syllabus. Relinquishing power and control, impossible. Cullen and Harris discuss the importance of sharing power within the class and the syllabus. Specifically, they state, a syllabus can re reveal attempts by the professor to create an environment where control is shared. They suggest that you shift this power and control through your thorough description of the teacher's role, the student's role, how you assign outside resources, and through the tone and focus of the syllabus. So stop and think for a minute. What is your role as a teacher? Do you have a clear answer? Are you a guide? Are you the sage on the stage? Are you an authority figure? Are you the herder of cats? Regardless of how you see yourself and your role, the most important question is, do you convey this role on your syllabus? So according to Cullen and Harris, the teacher's role should be one of shared power. And by sharing this power, students gain a sense of autonomy, self-motivation, self-regulation, and they may become more invested in the course. To share power in your syllabus and course, you should encourage your students on the first day of class to assist in developing course policies. Now, before I go any further with that statement, I think um, there, Cullen and Harris is, in my opinion, living in kind of some of dreamland because um, while I do believe there needs to be shared power within, um, within a classroom, I think that you shouldn't just say, hey, develop the policies that go on our syllabus. I do think it needs to kind of be a governed approach. Um, and if you can find that, um, you know, 
the balance, maybe in determining, have a choice of assignments, um, have a choice of or flexibility of due dates. Then you kind of have a shared vision and you can capitalize on that um, and capitalize on that momentum and kind of draw your students closer. So the following um, on your screen are suggestions to include um, balance of power in your course. Include your teaching philosophy in there. What does your teaching philosophy mean and why you are teaching this way? Once you develop that teaching philosophy, model it throughout the syllabus and include a description of both teacher and student expectations. So here you have an example um, of, uh, on the left, you see student expectations. This is kind of what you see in, in, in a syllabus. Just here, students, this is what you do. Um, I, when, I, when I read that particular part of the research, I really don't think I have seen another syllabus with both teacher and student expectations for the course. Um, and so you can see on the right side, you have both of them listed. And maybe that's the piece of, of shared power and negotiation. Ask the students, what do they expect? To make sure everybody's expectations are aligned. <laughs> so in the student role, or talking about the student role, another area of power and control that you can control in your syllabus. In your syllabus, do you inform the students of their responsibilities? Um, most instructors probably communicate a calendar of assigned readings, topics, and due dates. However, if you just stop there, the syllabus typically rates as more teacher-centered. Alternatively, do you allow students to present new content or new material in class? And do any of your projects require students to generate and synthesize knowledge? If the answer is yes, and you state this explicitly in your syllabus, then your syllabus would be considered more learner-centered because it has a more well-defined student's role. So, I know for a fact that faculty at Midway require students to generate and synthesize knowledge. I know that faculty at Midway require new material presentations or content presentations in the class. But do we explicitly state it in the syllabus as it's their responsibility, it's their role, or are we just listing it as an assignment to be completed? And that, that makes a really good point for this whole theme of a promising syllabus. Just one little tweak in the phrasing of your words, an assignment become, can be a, a, a list of things they have to do, or the assignment can become something they're responsible for. And in that way, they feel more obligated to take that ownership of that assignment and make it theirs. So here are some other strategies to incorporate kind of the balance of power and control. Um, and and I, I really liked these strategies. Um, ask the students on the first day of class to write a brief statement of why they're taking your course. What do they expect to learn? And what might help them achieve their learning goals? That's valuable information for you on that first day of class. It can help you assess teaching strategies, instructional strategies to reach or alter some of these expectations. Then on the last day of class, you repeat the process, but in the past tense. What did they achieve? What did they learn? And then you take these paired comments and you tack them on the next semester syllabus as student testimonials. So now, your new students see that your old students were invested in the course and you have laid the seed for their investment as well. 
Um, suggestion number two by Colin and Harris, in my opinion, um, you know, establishing pr participation policies as a, as a group is a great idea, but I think to maintain structure within the balance of power, um, this needs to be guided very carefully by the instructor. So yet another way to define the student's role in the syllabus is to describe an assignment as part of the participation grade that requires each student to give a mini topic lesson once a semester. In this lesson, they are responsible for sharing this new content and, and they're bringing new content to the table. In the end, the spirit of defining the student's role in your syllabus is, an empower to them, is to empower them and show them how to achieve their learning goals. With regards to outside resources listed in your syllabus, in your syllabus, are you the only source of knowledge? Or do you explain that students are responsible for seeking knowledge outside of the class that requires independent investigation? If your answer is the former, your syllabus is more teacher-centered regarding this element. When you first evaluate your syllabus based on the suggestion by Colin and Harris, you may scoff at the idea that your students should be responsible for outside resources because you are the expert in this field. However, in order to switch from a teacher to a learner-centered perspective, you should let your students know there will be all types of resources used in your course that extend beyond the textbook and that are also contributed by the student. So what you see here on the next screen is, um, you know, your typical required textbooks lists, um, but then um, you can see, you know, some other types of outside resources. And then that last bullet point, I am not the only one who will be responsible for resources in this course. This helps define that student role and empowers them to take charge of their learning. And then finally, in this particular section, before we get on to um, how to, you know, we're talking about power and control here, um, the, the, the last section where we can kind of identify places to improve this in our syllabus is with the tone and focus. Um, is your syllabus focused on teacher-established policies and procedures that are negotiable? Um, is there little or no mention of student learning outcomes, or are the outcomes tied to the assessments? Um, all of these, in addition to focus, including the tone, has significant implications for learner-centeredness. Is your tone positive, neutral, or negative? How would your students describe the tone? I suspect many students would say the tone of their typical syllabus was neutral or negative, probably because there's so much emphasis on policies, not their learning. So research suggests that the tone of your syllabus, friendly, positive, supportive, rewarding, can reveal your teaching philosophy and communicate who you are as an instructor. So to establish this good tone, use appropriate personal pronouns such as I, you, we, and, and supply supportive information, such as a description on how to succeed in the course. Some other things you may want to include, um, success tips you may want to incorporate into your syllabus. Um, tell them how to develop effective, I should say study, how to develop effective study habits for your particular area or field. Um, how to develop writing skills for your specific content area. And um, encourage them to dig deeper in the course by explaining that they will learn more about different topics as the semester progresses. And when you begin to study new things, concentrate on learning as much as you can to get a reach your and deeper, 
richer and deeper understanding of the course. So just, you know, changing kind of your tone and focus can do, do wonders for establishing a, a student-centered syllabi. So here's an example of tone and focus. If you look here, the warm and friendly language is a little bit different than what you normally see. To sum up some of the improvements we can make in syllabi based um, focusing on the factor of power and control, define your role as a teacher and include your teaching philosophy. Not a whole big paper teaching philosophy, but a paragraph will do. Communicate students' responsibilities beyond just the required assignments and readings. Model in your students that the model in your syllabus that the students are required to bring in outside resources and use warm and friendly supportive language. All right, last section. Evaluation and assessment. So we've talked about building community within our syllabus or within our class using the syllabus. We've talked about how the tone and focus of the syllabus can affect student empowerment. Um, now the last section is on um, the importance of learner-centered evaluation and assessment. Many faculty members concentrate their efforts on assessment and evaluation in the classroom. But do we describe these practices in the syllabus, and are their practices learner-centered? So let's take a look at grades. Perhaps you have sincerely thought about grading policies and have a detailed description in your syllabus that reflects your beliefs about grading. From a learner-centered perspective, it's not the grading policies per se that are significant, but rather their focus. Cullen and Harris suggest that when we focus on losing points and penalties, we are more teacher-centered. Alternatively, if we tie grades to the student learning outcomes, provide options for achieving points, and possibly not grade all the works assigned in the course, we are more learner-centered. In evaluating your syllabus, you may find you have great descriptions of grading policies, but tend to focus on the penalties. And you would need to ask yourself, are these specific grades tied to the SLOs? So here's an example of a learner-centered syllabus, kind of the grading policy. You can see here this particular instructor does little check-ins, or the, most of the drafts aren't, aren't graded. Um, so they do have some non-graded things. I think we risk their application in the field, because I'm, I'm pretty practical, is the student not completing that task. <laughs> but maybe if we framed the class from the beginning, they would, you know, to empower their, their, their learning and their interest in learning, they would, they would select to do the non-graded activities. So let's talk about feedback mechanisms. In what forms do you give feedback to your students? If you only give a midterm and a final and do not allow the students to see the test after taking it, like review it with them, then you're teacher-centered to the far left of the continuum. At the other end of the continuum, if you give periodic feedback that is intended to monitor learning, both graded and non-graded, test papers, um, uh, you know, short quizzes in class, polls, um, then you tend to be more learner-centered. So here are some examples of providing feedback. Allow time for students to debrief. Discuss the results and common errors after assessment experiences and to write their own suggestions for improvement. Debrief the exam in ways that promote learning. Show me why you think that answer was correct. 
then discuss or debate it and maybe give some points back for those who are coming to know it the way they should have in the first place. Allow students to choose best scores on example. Uh, or <laughs> allow students to choose best scores on assessments. For example, um, 10 of the highest quiz scores out of 12. Um, and then have students assess their own work before submitting or have them assess others work, other students' work before submitting. As with feedback mechanisms, some faculty use your summative and formative evaluations, including written and oral presentations, group work, peer evaluation. However, some teachers may assess student achievement only using, only using tests. Only using tests, teacher-centered. All those other ones, student-centered. Simply put, summative evaluations are meant to reveal what students have learned at the end of a unit of lesson, whereas formative evaluations are meant to provide feedback to both student and teachers during learning and during instruction. Therefore, you really should attempt to incorporate both in your course and then express it in detail in your syllabus, like you see here. I really like how the example describes to the students the difference in the types of assessments because I would bet money that students come to your class and they say, oh, I've got to take a test, whether it's a chapter test or a final, whether it's a quiz or, you know, they don't see the assessments having separate purposes unless we explain it to them. According to the rubric, according to Cullen and Harris, um, your syllabus is learner-centered if it ties the SLOs to specific assignments. Now, thanks to the Midway University syllabus template, we've got this particular <laughs> characteristic of a student-centered syllabus down pat. Um, ours is in just a fancy chart as compared to this, this particular list. Um, there's uh, no reason why you couldn't list them in both places, but I think our, our chart fulfills the requirements here for Cullen and Harris's effective learner-centered syllabus which is always nice to get a pat on the back that we're doing the right thing. So, you know, I've, I've heard people in the past um, balk at allowing students to rewrite and redo work in their classes. Now, I know that's not the case for our English people because the revision process is part of the process of writing. Um, but if you've ever thought about not allowing revisions and, and, and redoings, let, let me ask you this, this question. How many times have you submitted an article to a journal for publication or to um, um, another type of thing like that that was accepted without any comments or requested revisions? And so by asking students, um, you know, by telling students they can't revise, you know, then we're kind of being a little hypocritical. Now, let's say that everybody that listens to this webinar does allow revisions and, and redoings um, and redo work in their classes. But the point here is, is do you explain that in the syllabus? And so here's an example of how this could possibly be phrased and written in your syllabus. Notice, notice the tone 
notice the personification of this particular statement and consider yourself a student reading this statement. How does that make you feel about your instructor? Probably a little bit more positive than make sure you have this in by the due date. So, in summary, for evaluation and assessment, focus on tying SLOs to assessment. We got that one not, not um, we got that one knocked out. Um, provide periodic feedback to monitor learning and communicate that in your syllabus. Use both evaluation methods and provide opportunities for revision. So, the steps to a promising syllabus. Um, Evaluate your existing syllabus using the, the scale, the, the table two was the rubric that I chopped up into four different pieces earlier in the presentation. Um, so we'll post that for you. Um, create a plan for implementation, for changing your syllabus to a learner-centered syllabus. By identifying which syllabus elements you want to improve. You don't have to do all of them. Change one. Experiment. It doesn't have to be a one and done deal. I know we all don't have a lot of time to continually revise our syllabus, but some things are gonna work better for you as, as, as an instructor, and some things are gonna work better for you because of your content area. And then assess the implementation. If you change this, how do you know it's making a change in your syllabus? And of course, with everything assessment and evaluation, you keep the cycle going. So, with that being said, does anybody have any questions at all for me or want to discuss any particular um, pieces of this thing? How do you feel about it? What do you think? I personally really like it. Um, I do some of it already. This is Becky. And um, I just made a lot of notes about ways I would like to uh, reword things um, and explain things better. And I, I think it works better in some classes than others, but I already have some really good ideas of classes where I know that this would really fit in. Yeah, you know, that, that's kind of the same thought that I had. And I think um, for um, the amount of words that was said in this presentation, the act of actually changing your syllabus from teacher-centered to learner-centered is just merely editing a few words and how sentences are structured on your page. Right. Um, like a, this is one of, one of those you, you do a little, you get a lot kind of deals. And folks, we don't get a lot of those around in our parts. Right. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Ellen, Tom, Hiley here. Uh, yeah. The question that came to my mind, and you know, so much of what I do in my classroom is learner-centered, so all of that resonated, and I'm open to changing the language, you know, in these categories, but what I keep running up against in, in our college is there's this, this SACS requirements on syllabi that, that you know, I'm, I'm running into, and I'm, I'm told I have to do my syllabi this particular way, um, and that's going to be updated again, I guess, in the fall. So is there a kind of a conflict there between trying to come up with something that's a learner-centered you know, document and well, what's you know, it's, It is so funny that you asked that question because I've been involved in the um, syllabus template process mm -hmm. um, and in discussion with the uh, administration and the deans about it. And, and I think I – I think to be fair to the institution and, and the SACS requirements, we have to have those certain components in there that are there. Right. And, um, but that doesn't let – me, let, me, let me go back. Well, no, let me finish that sentence. That doesn't mean we can't add additional information. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to call it the, the, the feel-good stuff. Right. Um, I also know that in discussion – with the deans and academic affairs is that 
um, we've got two syllabi going around in our in our institution right. online and in seat the in seat has more flexibility the online's mm -hmm. Don't necessarily, like why I do think we can include this feel-good uh, student-centered language in there, it has to be rigid enough that an adjunct can come in, pick it up, and be able yeah. to do, do the job. Right. So I, I think, I think we've got a spectrum here of flexibility. Well, yeah. And a continuum of language. I, I think, you know, when we talk about going, you know, if one to ten, if one is doing you know, nothing of a learner-centered nature in the syllabus, and 10 is, you know, way, way kind of kumbaya. I mean, I think <laughs> you can move somewhere in the middle there to soften right. the language to, you know, make kind of build relationship without having, you know. Free-for-all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, at the same time, not doing away with that kind of language at all because it was funny because I, I found myself looking and thinking of my syllabus and thinking about what I am in class and it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I, I mean, know. I, I thought the same thing when I yeah. read the research. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I know what I do, but my syllabus doesn't really look that way, you know? Right, so. right. I, I think that was the whole point of this, um, of, of kind of this research from gotcha. what this is based off of, is that we, 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 we act one way when we get there, but... Um, you know, they get the syllabus ahead of time. So, you know, what are their, we've already set their expectations from the get-go. Right. Um, so then then what you're doing is, is you're having to not only get them adjusted to class, but now change their expectations because of right. the words on the syllabus. Right. Um, I do have a question with you for you guys, and, and I want your feedback on it because I have expressed how I felt about it, is this element of allowing students to decide policies and procedures in the class. How does that resonate mm -hmm. with you, and how would you handle well, that? It reminds me, and I'll, I'll shut up because I, I tend to dominate, and that's, I know that's a fault of mine, but I, I, it reminds me of what you used to do in the middle school classroom where you'd have kids do class rules at the beginning of the year. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was pretty effective. You know, I, I wouldn't have a problem, you know, if we could do it in a way where I would also have some input too. Right. right. And I think um, – where 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 the research was i struggled with it re reading that part and 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 doing the part not that i need to control them but i do think you have to set boundaries under which they can make those decisions or all hell will break loose i don't know the <laughs> way to put it <laughs> so are there any other any other questions or comments yeah dan had a point okay dan yeah, this is yeah, yeah, we we've got this uh, template thing that we have to work with, and all the policies and rules and guidelines all need to be stipulated two weeks before the class starts. And so that doesn't really open up us any kind of opportunity to do something once the class starts, because the syllabus is supposed to be completed in an advance so that the dean can take a look at it before the class starts. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge we've got here, uh, at least in, in the and I'm, I guess it's a university requirement also. So the having students participate in the setting policies is um, it was just a, it's, it's, it's just a challenge. I was yeah. going to say, it's a logistical yeah. nightmare. <laughs> I agree. I agree. But, you know, maybe, maybe one way to handle that is to, in, in the syllabus, setting the policies, that's where you set the boundaries. And then you can kind of negotiate, you know, possible due dates or, hey, we've got 15 quizzes, one a week. Um, you know, at that point, you can just, you, they now can decide which 10 they want to be put into the grade book. Right. So while it's still. I have a question. <clears throat> well, this is Joel. Yeah. Uh, do you have examples from different disciplines? <clears throat> um. In yes. other words, do you have like a, a learner-centered syllabus for Calculus 1 or something? Um, I will write down on my pad of paper to find one for Calculus 1, but I do have I mean, other just, examples. Just, just different ones because I'm not sure how I could do some of this stuff in a math class. Yeah, also, I was thinking about that too. 
Also, just about everything that's done here, I say in class when I give out syllabus, I say I'm available for this and that, and that uh, uh, I give a certain amount of flexibility for things, but I don't write it in my syllabus because so, I'm not sure a five-page syllabus needs to be a 10-page syllabus if I write everything down. Okay. All right. I, I, I see your point. I, I think what uh, Cullen and Harris would say is, well, why not? You know, what, you know if, if you're going to write a 10-page syllabus but establish that rapport with your students so that you get better results at the end, then it's better to give a 10-page syllabus. Um, and again, you know, um, establishing those things and saying those things when you hand out the syllabus is, is, is great, um, and I think that needs to be done, and, and I commend you for, for, for being student-centered like you are. Um, but this is just an idea to kind of get a jump on the game, whereas if your syllabi are distributed, you know, like we open up courses a week in advance. So if your syllabus, if you're using Moodle in, in your NC classes and you have the syllabus up there, now you have that time to pre-establish that rapport. Okay. All right. Hey, Ellen? Yeah. Um, kind of piggybacking a little bit on what Joel is saying. Um, I'm sitting here rolling through my head. How do, what's an example of how do we break this, like, protective syllabus of, you know, like, if I want to hide important information, I joke to my students, I'll put my passwords in my syllabus because it will never be seen. And I try to joke with them about it because I then turn around and go, well, you know, in the syllabus, and I bring it back up. But right. how do we break this? How do we break that down of other than going, let me give you a syllabus quiz? Because that's yet another graded thing they're thinking about. Do, I mean, is, does the research give some examples of how we can turn the syllabus into something our students want to look at? Um, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, that really is a good question. Um, and I'm going through my mind of all of the research that I read. And I, I'm going to have to think about that one. Oh, yeah. I, it's just yeah, a, it's that's a, a really good conversation right? to have. Like, how the do protected we... protected information of the syllabus that will well, never be seen. Well, kind of what I'm yeah. thinking is, is, you know, here Joel is saying, you know, if I'm going to make a 10-page syllabus, you're saying they darn well better read it. <laughs> like, right. like, I get that. I get yeah. that. Um, so how, how, besides the threat, you know, of a, of a quiz... Well, couldn't it be, could it also be a formative assessment? I mean, you can give a quiz that doesn't necessarily, that it might even be anonymous, you know, making use of the poll everywhere kind of technology. You could give a quiz that measures how much they actually know about the syllabus that doesn't necessarily have to result in points. Well, and, you know, I just had an idea. And that, that gave me an idea. So let's say you write that paragraph philosophy. One of your questions um, so your, your quiz, your syllabus quiz doesn't say, you know, how many ex papers are due, but it all, well, it does ask, you know, like those types of questions, but what is, what if one of the question was, is how do I feel about, you know, teaching or, you know, you know, more of the touchy, make touchy feeling or, um, in your, in, in, in your introductory Hi. or in your syllabus, you know, you can, uh, who am I, you know, so what is your professor's favorite hobby, you know, that sort of thing. So now they know that there's more in that syllabus. And, and I think this isn't a change that would make overnight. So right. class, you know, fall semester class reads the syllabus, and now their friends signed up for your same class, and they're like, make sure you read the syllabus. You know, now the word gets out, word of mouth, because there's more to it than just a regular syllabus. Right. That might be a stretch, but that's what I just came up well, with. Well, could you, here's a dumb thing. Could you actually have a syllabus quiz that is extra points? Yeah. I was thinking of that. Yeah. Because yeah, that way it's like, hey, you don't know when you're going to need these points, but you're going to have some if you do well on this syllabus quiz. Or, hey, you're going to need these points. <laughs> <laughs> That's like <Yeah. laughs> 
Oh, goodness. Well, folks, we have exhausted our time. I don't want to take any more than I have to. If you have other questions, I'll be glad to stay on. But um, I've had an enjoyable evening. Thank you for listening to me rap for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, your questions were incredible, absolutely incredible. What? So, Ellen, yes. Uh, do we have a lunch and learn um, uh, session that is from the same book on uh, Friday? Yes, and we're okay. it, it's an, it, we're going to have little clips uh, pieces from the book for you all to discuss. This mm -hmm. is mostly designed by librarian Manny because it's book and she knows all those cool <laughs> book things to do. So um, I like to tap my resources and maximize them out. So um, yeah, we're all going to have a good time and get together and talk more about Ken Bain. Well, that's and, good because and, and get fed. And get fed. That's good. <laughs> and Bonnie just told me that uh, she had read this book and it was really good. So we've got a good endorsement. Oh, I'll excellent. give you a secondary endorsement there. It is a good book. Yeah. And tell Banu if she wants to truck along and join us. She's more than welcome. I will. That's a okay. good idea. Yeah. Thank Bring you. her on. You heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any other questions? No, we're good to go. I'm, I'm... Thank you. All Thank right. You. you guys take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.